good afternoon to all our viewers welcome to another episode of dent essential today's topic of discussion is evaluation and management of orofacial pain and tmj disorder now temporo uh, mandibular disorder joint dysfunction is one of the etiologies of for orofacial pain a multidisciplinary approach including both non pharmacological and pharmacological modalities should be considered for the optimal treatment of orofacial pain so in the uh, you know in the uh, mechanically demanding and biochemically active environment of the tmj therapeutic approaches to restore joint functionality while responding to changes in the joint have been becoming a necessity to know more about this we have with us dr tofik gora welcome sir thank you thank you uh, he is currently the oral and maxillofacial surgeon at maxillofacial surgery of india msi and also the senior consultant at sl raheja hospital a fortis associate mumbai in mumbai he is a profession consultant in oral and maxillofacial surgery with a keen interest in the in the field of dental implantology he's also done an extensive work uh, and has experience in dental and zygomatic implants dr bora is also trained in performing sinus lip surgeries along with rib split procedures and bone grafting procedure he is also one of the pioneers in the field of tmj arthroscopy in india and performs all levels of tmj arthroscopy along with total temporomandibular joint replacement surgery and reconstruction he is a member of several prestigious medical associations including the american society of tmj surgeons the association of oral and maxillofacial surgeons in india and the international society of head and neck trauma in addition to that he is also an editorial team member for the international open access journal of surgery he has been nominated as one of the most renowned oral and maxillofacial surgeons to look out in uh, 2023 by Theo Look India Magazine. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you with us here, sir. We would have a couple of questions for you if we may start. You so, regarding that? the membership for American Society of TMJ Surgeons, I would like to put it ahead that we are in process of achieving. I have been nominated for the membership, and uh, I am going to present a series of cases, which are which will lead to an official active membership. I just want to put that across. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so, starting off with our lecture today, if you would want to talk about the TMJ disorders, so what is a TMJ disorder? So, see, the TMJ disorders is actually a very blanket term. What happens is in uh, our scenario, what we are looking at most of the times, uh, TMJ disorders are looked from only from the internal derangement point of view. So that's uh, why because. Uh, that is something which a normal dentist will come across most of the times that is internal derangement clicking sound clicking popping sounds pain in the jaw pain while chewing all these things but tmj disorders is a very broad term actually it will also include condylar hyperplasia growth deformities it will include trauma trauma can also lead to tmj disorders then uh, you may have uh, condylar tumors these things will also be under temporomandibular joint disorders now in tmj disorders yes the most prevalent form of tmj disorders what we come across is internal derangement when you say internal derangement that's something to take uh, talk about uh, the disc and the biomechanical stability of the joint so tmj disorders in a nutshell will include three main components which is the joint the internal joint environment the teeth the occlusion and the muscular component of the face that will comprise and problem with these systems will lead to tmd that is temporomandibular joint disorders yeah thank you so much for putting context um so how does tmj disorders affect a person's life so uh start to begin with tmj disorders normally is a very disturbing kind of a problem disturbing as in initially when it starts it just starts with a little bit of click here and there and the patient is good to go specifically in our indian scenario uh a normal click here and there is not a concern for the patient and frankly it should not be also a, a small click occasional click is not a problem but when it starts becoming very chronic now this is very disturbing actually when you consider a patient it may sound uh, okay but when it is constantly clicking and popping there are patients we have come across who hear a click 
also when they are talking not only eating when they are talking it keeps on clicking and popping so it first to start with it becomes really disturbing then it converts into pain and then there is actual reduction in mouth opening so these patients how does it affect their life they you will actually come across tmj patient saying that okay i have made a lifestyle modifications i can eat these things and i cannot eat these things they have they have accepted the fact so this is something which is very uh, if you look at the larger spread of things yes you can eat a few things you cannot eat a few things this is a huge compromise secondly needless to say tmj eventually will convert into a more complex form of pain in the head and neck region which we know as orofacial pain or mpds so yes it does compromise standard of living actually of that patient sure sir yeah thank you so much Uh, moving ahead, sir. What is the relation of TMJ and orofacial pain? I think you did talk about it briefly. Yes. Yeah. So what happens is the way I look at it is I say purely from my own small experience what I have with these problems. I have been working in this field now for uh, say five years dedicatedly, and uh, I would say that treating TMJ, you realize that eventually at the end game you are treating orofacial pain. So these patients. so say let's talk about tmj in three components internal joint let's let's form a triangle in our head internal joint occlusion and muscles okay now when these three things are in perfect harmony that's when the patient is fine yeah. okay it's it's an ecosystem like how apple has an ecosystem where in the same way tmj is also an ecosystem comprising of these three things when any one of these goes out of order that's when the actual problem starts that's when orofacial pain starts because what happens is let's say there is internal derangement inside the joint now till the time it is with reduction so we will come to that these terms with reduction without reduction all these things but by the time it is at the initial stage everything is fine <coughs> but when or say say uh, a patient is having a constricted bite or a very heavy deep bite now the joint of this patient because of the deep bite is pushed behind this leads to muscle hyperactivity eventually this patient is going to come to your office saying that i have pain in full region my full right side pains my full left side pains there are patients saying everything pains you touch anywhere in the face it starts pain eventually orofacial pain will convert into crps the full form is complex regional pain syndrome now this patient earlier was able to point out that okay it's paining over here eventually this patient will not be able to point out where it is pain then it becomes a regional thing this full side pains i don't know where the everything pains on this side now that's orofacial pain normally these patients you will see most of these patients conveniently being diagnosed at trigeminal neuralgia because it's a very common uh, what do you say diagnosis okay okay this kind of pain it's trigeminal neuralgia but most of the times i'll tell you it is not trigeminal neuralgia when you effectively go in with diagnostic blocks you realize that it is not trigeminal neuralgia and it is more of just orofacial pain which has been triggered because of a condition so makes sense yeah um so you did talk about the relation how tmj and orofacial pain you know you talk about the triangle is there something known as orofacial dystonia yes uh, yes this is something which is actually not known to a lot of people but the the full term uh, would be oromandibular dystonia okay now this is a very very rare condition it does not you don't come across these cases very often mm -hmm. in fact i have been fortunate to deal with two cases of this format in the entire span one patient having masseteric dystonia so what happens in this is this is not a direct presentation so uh, these kind of dystonias are not something which are the first presentation when you sit with these patients you will uh, take a complete history and you will realize that he or she is going to have some underlying thing which has led to this dystonia now there is an entire group which talks about dystonia and there can be multiple causes i look at it 
especially in the head and neck region from TMJ point of view. So now this patient who I had, uh, he had masseteric dystonia where just he used to sit like how you and I are sitting and his masseter muscle used to constantly twitch. Mm. I have recorded that. I will utilize those videos in my uh, upcoming webinars where these twitching can be seen. The patient is not moving at all. He's not moving his lower jaw. The muscle is constantly twitching and it's happening only on his left side. Even the right side is normal. You go ahead, you go dig in deep, you will come across internal rearrangement. You will come across this patient having a constant chewing habit. And now this is classical muscle hyperactivity. This patient initially when he came to me was put on uh, stabilization splints. So we started with that and eventually we had to use higher modes because yes, the intensity went down, but it used to still twitch. So now this twitch, this is an involuntary twitch. This is called dystonia. Mm. And it is not only present in these muscle groups, it can happen in multiple muscle groups. My second patient I treated had lingual dystonia. Lingual dystonia means, and he had open jaw lingual dystonia. So yeah, it's a little complicated. But what happens is this patient was perfectly normal till the time he opens his mouth. As soon as he starts to talk, he loses control over his tongue and has slurred speech. Now, how do you deal with this case? <laughs> so yeah, we went ahead, we dealt with it. Uh, again, the same uh, mode of treatment, uh, looking at the entire thing holistically and seeing to what actually led to this. However, in this case, TMJ was not much of a problem how much was the local thing affecting. But we went ahead and we used Botox actually in his cases under guidance, uh, under USG guidance, ultrasonography. And we went ahead and we Botoxed both sides of his tongue muscles and we put him on speech therapy. Obviously, it's not an overnight affair, but yeah, we do see progress in such cases. So this is oromandibular dystonia to answer your question. It is, I, f I find much more compromising than TMD. And um, I think you, because you're talking about, you know, related diseases, I would say, is there a relation between TMJ and sleep apnea as well? Yes, yes, there is. And uh, in fact, uh, even this aspect of TMJ has to be understood very closely because you find a lot of obese patients coming with TMJ disorders. The first thing your mind should go is towards his AHI index, which is the sleep apnea index. Mm -hmm. Now, these patients normally, so what happens is, uh, it is theoretical. But yes, it does happen. These patients normally, when they are into apnea, so to understand this first, you need to understand what is obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, for most doctors, for most people, when they are sleeping and uh, when they get up because of lack of oxygen in the sleep, that's called as the phase of apnea. Now, obstructive sleep apnea means because of obesity, this part of your uh, you can, you may say neck or the lower mandibular region just pushes the tongue behind. And when the patient is in supine position, his posterior pharyngeal airway space becomes constricted. And that's when the breathing stops and the patient gets up from sleep. Now you may say that, okay, what has this to do with TMJ? But these patients have a constant tendency to put their jaw forward. That is protrusion. They protrude their jaw. And which eventually over a period of time leads to internal rearrangement of the joint. Basically makes the joint much more biomechanically unstable. That's the term. So that's how it is related. In, in those relations, you may also consider DNS. So, sir, are there, is yeah. so are there any also household remedies which we can suggest to patient to help with the DMJ pain? Yeah, so when you talk about household remedies, see, till the time it is in control and uh, you have uh, come to a realization that yes, it is a TMJ problem. How, how, how do these people come to realization? We, it's episodic. Mm -hmm. So this patient will typically say that, okay, there one year back, I had a closed lock. But then things got okay. The other patient may say, one year back, I was eating a burger and my just mouth remained open. I could not close it. So, but uh, I adjusted it and it popped back in. 
So now this patient now needs to be careful. The patient who had an open lock needs to be careful that they do not open that wide again in future. The closed lock patient has to be careful that they do not eat something very chewy because yes, that will lead to a pain response and in inversely related uh, to a uh, uh, what you say lock job situation. Plus, uh, beyond that, when there is an immediate injury, you can use cold ice cold applications. This helps. But if the injury is chronic and now it has been happening multiple times, then hot bag fermentation helps a lot. This I have seen in these in my patients when they use hot bag fermentation, it helps them alleviate their pain and also improves the function because it increase, increases blood supply to that particular area and uh, helps to flush out the inflammatory mediators. It is a little bit uh, technical over here, but yes, pain happens inside the joint because of inflammatory mediators. So these are the household remedies. You may uh, visit your local dentist at the earliest and get a night guard made. That night guard will help in load sharing. And by far, this is what you can do uh, in, with regards to home remedies. So, sir, you talked about the management and how do we sort of, you know, treat it and what are the different conditions. But how does one understand this? It's probably for the patient. So, how would, uh, what are the things that we're looking at and how does a patient understand whether he or she is suffering from a DMJ disorder and what should they consult? So, see, I'll, I'll say it purely on the previous experiences that these patients have come and described the way it is. Uh, so, it's whenever you start having regular clicks, that is the first. It's a given that when you start having regular clicks, let it be an opening click, let it be a closing click. Whenever there is clicking happening regularly, that is the first marker that, okay, now there is something wrong with my joint. Pain, if you wait for the pain to come, you do too much ahead in the sequence of problems. So clicking is the first sign. Uh, problem during chewing is the another sign. These people, these patients are more of, more than often complaining about having stiffness in the face. So, uh, the best way to explain stiffness in the face is facial muscle fatigue. So, these patients will come and say, Ki, Sir, I have a lot of pain, but I can't eat more than one roti, because I get tired of the job. Hmm. This is a typical complaint. Hota hai. This is a typical complaint from a TMC patient. That I feel very tired in my face. And uh, yeah, these patients, uh, when you dig in deep, they, you will realize that they are avoiding a lot of foods, uh, foods which they cannot eat because of the same problem. And that also acts as a marker. Beyond that, uh, yeah, there are radiological methods to deal with uh, the findings. So... My next question is about why is there so much confusion related to management modalities in TMJ disorders? So, so see, the, frankly speaking, I don't see any confusion. Okay, There is no confusion. See, uh, if, if you ask us, we have been uh, reading Laskin and all these authors who are the standard authors who have written TMJ uh, books who, who, who have actually... Uh, made it uh, very simple for us. What we need to understand is that TMJ is dealt at three places, as I said, the joint, the occlusion, and the uh, muscular component of it. Now, muscles have uh, a tendency to reprogram and deprogram, but it takes time. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. What you can manage is the joint and the occlusion. Now, I know, I am aware of people from my fraternity, that is surgeons, who are who, who swear by surgeries, okay, and do not uh, involve the occlusion that much in this uh, whole treatment plan. And then there are people who are constantly treating the occlusion. So what happens is this discrepancy of we will promote what we know is actually the confusion. <laughs> what everybody needs to understand is, as I said, that this is a ecosystem which needs to function in harmony. TM temporomandibular joint is no different than any other joint. Okay. What leads to these problems is most of the times trauma, local arthritis. Okay. 
then occlusion disturbances now now see in occlusion there are industries there are people who are treating the occlusion at very high level but when i treat these patients what i see to it that you need a passive stabilized occlusion hmm. okay by that what i mean is that if there is a problem in the joint you treat the joint if there is a problem in occlusion you treat the occlusion as well if you cannot treat the occlusion overnight because yes occlusional problems unlike surgery cannot be treated overnight sometimes they require orthodontic some so there's a lot of mal occlusion there is a deep bite all these things take time in the meanwhile because the patient has come to you in severe pain or severe restriction or mechanical obstruction because of the joint get rid of that also address the occlusion now how would you address the occlusion you say that sir it takes so much time in the meanwhile give a stabilization splint let the jaw get stabilized and then you can move so now when you when you have dealt with two things the third thing will come in line the muscle hyperactive will uh, hyperactivity will start decreasing this muscle is becoming hyperactive because of something going wrong in these two aspects most of the times what happens is patient comes to you with multiple complaints now see this is the head and neck region okay there there can be a lot of overlapping symptoms uh, when you sit over there you the the patient will say i had pains in my eyes it pains behind it pains in the temple it pains in the crown it pains in my shoulders my neck everywhere it is pain how would you dissect the problem out at this that point of time so you go in objectively you get the reports done you get the mri reports done and then moving ahead you start treating problem one by one and also you inform the patient that it has not happened overnight to you it will not go overnight confusion lies it, there is only confusion when you keep treating only one thing thinking that the other will come back to normal on its own there there was a previous time when a uh, disc displacement which is a disc is present between the joint uh, between both the bony surfaces when this disc is displaced there was only one way to deal with it which was open joint surgery but now we have arthroscopy in picture and we will talk about it in the future i guess in that sure sir i think we can take it ahead in our future lectures um my next question is so what should be the given preference in the management of tmj conservative approach or a surgical help there is no doubt that every time a patient comes to you you have to start with conservative first okay that's a given it's there everywhere but the problem is that when a patient is beyond a certain uh, stage of the problem continuously ma- managing the patient conservatively also bears no fruit okay so when you say conservative management you are looking at something in which you are just managing symptomatically okay internal rearrangement the symptom is pain in the face pain in muscles muscle hyperactivity uh, stiffness etc etc you give them you give the patient a splint a night guard something expect all those symptoms to go down what happens when the patient is off that splint that is something to consider so now when these patients for example a patient who has already been diagnosed with a disc which is displaced and without reduction so if you allow then i would explain uh, with reduction and without reduction at this moment of time the disc when when the disc is still popping back in the right position after opening the mouth that is this displacement with reduction in normal sense the disc is at least mobile it is still moving and it is at this stage that the patient actually feels the click because the disc is popping back in position coming back okay so it's displacing and it's popping back in position that is with reduction there will come a time when the disc is displaced and now it is displaced for good it is not popping back anymore this patient will not have any clicking sounds now but mouth opening will decrease so now this scenario if you try to manage this scenario with conservative management i personally feel it is much more sensible to go in there when you have arthroscopy at disposal you should go in there get the disc back in position 
at least get it mobile and have it back at the normal function because what happens is clinicians are i think relying too much on the remodeling capacity of tmj practically speaking you cannot achieve that kind of remodeling in day to day life i have tried achieving that kind of remodeling you need to have the same amount of force very calibrated force the occlusal force i'm talking about on that patient's joint and the patient has to abide by the rules by the book and religiously that amount of follow up we don't have we don't have i mean it may take 3 years for that joint to remodel that patient is not going to be in touch with you for 3 years there are patients who, who do stay in touch but most of them just uh, waver off some people fly abroad some people are just not in that position to come and see you again right? so there is a lot of patient compliance going in here so remodeling is overrated i think yes it does happen but it will happen in a best case scenario when the disc is back in position at least in a case without reduction and then to maintain that position occlusal forces need to be managed i'm sorry i forgot the question <laughs> what is the question so basically we wanted to understand that you know um what should be the given preference when it comes to uh, tmj yeah. should it be cut yeah. so yes 100% conservative first but clinicians have to draw a line i mean it is uh, it would be very uh, criminal to just take a patient and operate if the patient lies in conservative but it is also not good for a patient who requires surgery to keep him restrained to a particular form of treatment uh, and not provide surgical help i would not say surgery is going to treat tmj because treating tmj is not something which happens on daily basis you cannot treat tmj disorders they are always managed because this joint is going to be there inside you you even if you plan to remove the joint in future it's going to be replaced with an artificial joint this joint is going to be there inside so you are always going to be in plus minus situations but yes these problems are best managed and that's why i say that management has to be planned it has to be a planned management so yeah, conservative first 100% let's so. go to the uh, next question sir so uh, sir does uh, psychological stress have a role play in tmd and orofacial pain uh yes so psychological stress and uh, I, you know stress is one thing but also the mindset of the patient matters okay because uh, when you talk about the pain world pain management world in in this uh, aspect catastrophizing one's problem catastrophizing means thinking of the problem more than what it actually is is the major concern hmm so what it does is it develops a vicious cycle of pain causing stress about the pain and stress causing more pain so it becomes a circle now this patient is caught in this vicious circle and when you say stress stress actually is in tmj related to parafunctional habits so what happens is if somebody is under stress so there are a few people who have habit of clenching then grinding their teeth they they tend to grind their teeth when they are under stress mm-hmm. subconsciously they are not aware about it but they do that and uh, bruxism you be all know in the night uh, when they are sleeping comfortably you have a good rem sleep it will not happen but when they are stressed it will increase over a period of time you will be surprised to the amount of parafunctional habits i came across a child a student an engineering aspirant somebody told him that you have to chew each and every uh, food uh, what do you say bite 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 of food 36 times mm-hmm. okay now this has been fed to him and he is completely convinced about the fact now he bites each and every food bite 36 times <laughs> in respect of needed or not okay now this is something which is just there second thing this same student had he cannot study without speaking 
So now he's an aspirant. He has to study for many, many hours in a day and he constantly keeps on speaking the entire day. And then he says that I feel pain in my face, which is pretty much obvious because now this is, this is actually para-functional. You have, this joint is not meant for all this. You have put an excessive load on the joint. There was this patient, a young female who had a habit of constantly nail biting. Now, nail biting sounds very trivial, but it is an important part of the history because to bite a nail, you have to protrude your jaw. We stopped the nail biting habit of the patient. She started improving. Did not do anything in that case. So, yes, these, these things. And, and she was nail biting when she was under stress. You watching a horror film, you start biting your nails. <laughs> but yeah, that does create uh, a lot of force on the joint. When this happens for long term, yes, it does create a lot of difference. Okay. Um, going ahead, I would like to know why is TMJ arthroscopy becoming such a valuable addition to the TMD universe now? So, what is happening over the years is, as I said, as I mentioned previously, that in the uh, previous given time, whenever we wanted to even create a specific form of movement inside the joint, it was open joint. Because there is no other modality to look inside the joint. Arthrosynthesis was always there and is still there. But that is again a blind procedure. Arthrosynthesis, you put two needles and you are not aware whether the needle is in the superior joint compartment or the inferior joint compartment. And uh, most of the times it's a, most of the time, always, it's a blind procedure. It is flushing the joint, but it does not flush that amount of RN from the joint. Now, this is something technical, but yes, arthroscopy is way superior to arthrosynthesis. Arthrosynthesis is constantly happening when you're performing arthroscopy. Because arthroscopy happens under constant flush of RL. RL is a ringer lactase solution, which is used to flush the joint and also flush the inflammatory mediators uh, from the joint. That This is the premise of arthrosynthesis. You flush the joint, basically. Earlier, they used to say that when you flush the joint, you also break adhesions, which are found inside the joint. But adhesions cannot be broken uh, when you are having, uh, when, when you're doing arthrosynthesis, you need arthroscopy to break these adhesions. And uh, you, you, during an arthroscopy, you can also introduce multiple instruments inside the joint, which will help you to deal with other problems. You can also use laser, you can also use cautery inside the joint, which is actually a very big leap ahead uh, in the field of TMJ, where between conservative management and going straight to an open joint surgery. Arthroscopy is going to prove extremely uh, influential and important okay. in uh, making the joint biomechanically stable. Sure, sir. Um, I think something about physiotherapy. So do physiotherapy and other modalities also make a difference? Yes, they do. But physiotherapy has to be reserved for post-procedural rehab. Now, if there is a patient who has come to you with a perforation, say, in the disc or in the disc is displaced, okay, it's anteriorly displaced. Now, the condyle is covered with retrodiscal tissues and there is a perforation over there. Now, this patient, when he or she is going to uh, chew or bite, it is going to tear that part of the tissue. Now, if you are doing physiotherapy, you are loading it even more. So, over here, physiotherapy is not indicated. Physiotherapy is just indicated in cases where you want to increase range of motion, which most of the times works post-procedure. Um, a couple of more questions. So, uh, why are there not so many oral and maxillofacial surgeons performing arthroscopy or even promoting it? So, uh, there are people who are promoting it. Maxillofacial surgeons are now on board and they are promoting this kind of procedure because yes, we do see merit in it. The only problem is that we do not have actual training centers over here who are promoting and uh, training for this. Like uh, I had been to US uh, for TMJ mini residency uh, from University of Maryland and 
that's precisely where which was a comprehensive course where you require a lot of training pmj arthroscopy uh, per se has a very steep learning curve it's difficult mm-hmm. to find your way around the joint actually it takes a lot of experience uh, to go through the joint frankly speaking even after so many cases i do still get lost inside the joint i don't understand where i'm looking at so yes it is uh, difficult and that level of training we have not uh, established yet in indian scenario but uh, soon it will be there and there will be a lot of maxillofacial surgeons doing arthroscopy it it will become a mainstay thing like it is in the world of orthopedics correct okay um moving ahead sir could you explain in short what does arthroscopy do basically so arthroscopy is a procedure where the surgeon puts a small scope inside the joint okay arthroscopy is constantly being done in the world of orthopedics in the knees in the shoulders it is also being done in the wrist and ankle okay mm-hmm. now uh, wrist and ankle is much similar to tmj because in tmj arthroscopy we are using a very small scope you might have heard of laparoscopy mm-hmm. you might have heard of endoscopy okay. so these scopes are pretty broad and our joint the temporomandibular joint is very small so we what we use is a 1.9 mm scope which is smaller than the almost 2 mm 2 mm is nothing it's like a thick needle with that arthroscopy you can also put in three more ports ports means channels to yeah. introduce multiple instruments inside the joints and that gives you actually a lot of access you can even pass a stitch level 3 arthroscopy means you can also pass a stitch through the disc and see to it that that disc does not slip again mm. you can lo- use laser for the lateral tibial muscle arthroscopy is also used for targeted injections okay in most cases of anterior disc displacement which i will show in my uh, future presentations this disc anteriorly is connected with a muscle called as lateral tibial muscle mm. now this lateral tibial muscle when is hyperactive it it goes under spasm and it pulls the disc ahead you can go and give targeted botox in that muscle and reduce the hyperactivity of that muscle immediately and that will lead uh, may, uh, get the disc back in position you can go you can put lasers on the retrodiscal tissue and get the scarring effect and pull the tissue uh, pull the disc back so all in all except for bony changes all the soft component can be managed via arthroscopy at least in india in us they also have micro debriders and micro shavers which can actually get rid of bony debris also which will come in india eventually with time and we would be using that in the future uh moving ahead i think a couple of more questions so how often do you see uh, or how often do you use botox for treating tmj uh yes it is used uh, not very often i would say but yes so see the way we treat is uh first we stage the patient clinically where does he or she lie if the problem is not that severe if everything is okay and under uh, good parameters they go for conservative treatment first most of times when they follow conservative treatment i think they do well and sometimes when needed i intervene for the surgical help that's all now these patients where they have uh, they are in the highest stages of the problem and uh, now we have already gone ahead done done uh, scopy we have scoped the joint now the patient is in under the conservative hands uh, even now if the hyperactivity is way more than what is there then we go ahead and we give botox to buy time we chemically go and reduce the hyperactivity and uh, yeah we did with the problem um so are there also cases that require open joint surgery yes so in with me yes i do uh, draw a line where arthroscopy works and where it does not in most scenarios uh, when the patient is suffering with the problem for more than a few years what we see is the prognostic value of arthroscopy so now 
if a patient is having this displacement since a long period of time and uh, the disc are displaced the muscles have reprogrammed in those uh, scenarios do going in performing an arthroscopy and just pushing the disc behind is not going to help in these patients so here you need to deal with this joint in a radical manner also in an open joint procedure we get the freedom to perform an eminectomy yeah. so you can get rid of the eminence you can you don't need to really get rid of the eminence but you can actually make it gradual and uh, increase the joint space in that process and the patient uh, feels much more comfortable and in an open surgery personally this is my personal thing i feel uh, more confident about the prognosis because the surgeon in an open surgery has a little more of play area and can do much more than what you can do in an arthroscopy but then everything has its own merits and demerits so yeah open surgery is more risky from the patient or point of view Okay, so one last question. So, does growth also affect TMJ, heteropathy, hypertrophy, sir? Hypertrophy. hypertrophy. Yeah. So, condylar hyperplasia, condylar hypertrophy is something which is a growth modification where one side of the condyle grows more as compared to the other. This is basically an asymmetry, which can result in hemifacial uh, growth, or only the condylar part of the face can grow in size. and uh, yeah that is a uh, genuine problem but then that is purely surgical there is nothing else in that no sir yeah uh, so i think dr bora these were all the questions i had for today would you like to tell the audience about some of, some of our upcoming lectures or if you would talk about some key takeaway message for our audience yeah so see now uh, the session of ours was just an overview uh, q and a kind of a thing to just give an idea of what we are going to go ahead in time i would like to go ahead and show uh, a few cases i would like to go ahead and show a few niche cases uh, cases where we have performed arthroscopy arthroscopy videos can be shown personally i would like to discuss the dystonia case it, it was an interesting case difficult to treat case uh, Yeah, so I'm looking forward to these webinars and uh, a little more in that. I mean, yeah. with a little pictures, not just me blabbering around. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Doctor Topic, for being here and speaking to us on such a pressing issue. But dear audience, uh, please stay tuned, and we'll have more such lectures. Uh, hopefully, in the month of July, we'll have the first lecture where he will also be showing a part two of this lecture where we'll discuss about case studies and. videos that he promised us to show so uh, we'll be staying uh, you know let's stay tuned to that and with this we'll close today's session thank you so much the audience for joining in and thank you so much dr bora it was lovely having you with us here um, we'll connect very very soon for more such lectures have a good evening sir thank you bye thank you